get going here. I've got a, a few things. I'm, it's a little early, but I've got a few preliminaries, and this one lasts a full hour. So uh, I figured, you know, we'll start going. Hey, before you hit that, I want to show this. Yeah. Now, some of you may have some of these little trinkets. They're one ounce bars of gold. Anybody have an idea what this little thing is worth today? $2,100. It's actually worth more than that because the price of it's up. A million. No, it's not there. <laughs> 30 or 2,000? It's, it's about 2,400. And if you think about this little bar being $2,400, imagine what Norway had uh, when the war broke out because they had over 120 million Kroner, which is five times the American dollar. So they really had like 700 and some million times 2,400 bucks. Long That's a lot of mula. You're right. All right. I will get going uh, on this. Thank you all for coming and hopefully. Uh, you'll learn some things that you didn't know before. I'm sitting down through this. I've got, you know, back problems. And I don't want to stay. No, but anyway, tolerate with me. Um, in 1935, Nic Nicolay Rugg, the man responsible for all the gold at the North Bank in Oslo, had pre prepared contingency plans for Norway's treasury in case there was an invasion. Now, you all remember that uh, when Germany started invading countries, one of the first things they did was they attacked their wealth. Um, they'd go to their banks. They'd go to their any place they could, uh, even art museums. They'd go any place they could get gold, silver, um, you name it, if it was wealth, because that financed the war machine. So, um, in case of, an ev of invasion, they prepared in 1938. As the tensions escalated in Europe, they packed much of the gold up in crates to be ready for transport. During the next two years, a large part of Norway's gold was shipped to America for investment, but law required that the Nord Bank maintain the equivalent of 120 million kroner. That's what they had in country. They had shipped out about four-fifths of their other stuff before that. The finance minister um, tried to get the law changed, but it didn't happen. Here's what it kind of looked like. They had, you know, these, and these are uh, a thousand grams um, of 99.5% pure because um, they're easier to handle, but one bar of that would weigh a lot. <laughs> In 1940, the National Treasury still contained 55 plus ton of gold bullion cast into bars worth over 240 million Norwegian kroner, approximately 54 million in U.S. That's 2.4 billion U.S. in 19 in 2022 stored in the main vault in Oslo. In 39, when World War II broke out in Poland, the plans were accelerated. The gold was packed in 820 crates of 40 kilograms, 685 crates of 25 kilograms, 39 barrels of gold coins, and. Uh, each weighing 80 kilograms for a total of slightly over 55 tons. When news reached the Norway government um, shortly after midnight on April 9th of 1940 that a patrol boat, um, the Pole 3, had been attacked and the 
enemy ships were coming up the harbor toward Oslo, they set in motion two very important events that eventually saved the country from destruction. Here's a picture of a German e-boat, um, which they were kind of like our PT boats uh, during World War II. They were very fast. They had torpedoes on them. Um, they were nasty quitters, and they were mainly assault ships. The little pole, if you look at it, right down there, there's my thing right there, looks like nothing more than a fishing barge, uh, even though it did have a couple cannons on it. Um, it wasn't much of a match. Not initially knowing the scope of the German invasion that was taking place, but assuming that the king, the royal family, the Norwegian government, and all of them were in danger, they hastily evacuated them by train and motor coach to Elverum, about 60 miles northeast of Oslo for safekeeping. When word of the German invasion reached Norway's finance minister, the Quidorn Hours, he decided to get rid of the gold bullion too and moved it from the North Bank in Oslo up to Lillehammer to protect it from, you know, the invading Germans along with special armed guards. He knew the national treasure needed to be secured or it would be lost. Here's the map of where they went. They got out of the red down on the bottom, down, down there, come on, right there, is Oslo. And then the king went this way and the gold went this way up the little hammer. They didn't want to follow the same path, just in case. Here's a picture of the North Bank in Oslo. And in the early morning, pre-dawn hours, with its police escort, 26 lorries, vans, trucks containing 50 million or so um, of the Norwegian bullion, they set up in a convoy on its way to, to Lillehammer. The convoy had reached junction of the main road and encountered an endless stream of private cars, all leaving the city for the mountains before it was too late to escape. Without their police escort, it would have been impossible to get through the solid uh, block of private vehicles. But at the sight of the blinking blue lights, welcome. Thank you. I started a little early. That's a kid very early. Um, to get through the uh, side of the, the blink, the, the drivers automatically swerved to the side of the road, allowing the entire convoy through. Now, all of you have been driving, I'm sure, at some time and seen police or emergency vehicles coming up behind. I've seen people not even pull over. These guys did. They drove past all the cars until the road ahead of them was snow-covered and clear. They gathered speed in an urgent attempt to reach Lillehammer before the pre-dawn hours. The light snow didn't impede their problem, but it did slow them down, especially around the sharp corners. Tiresome, difficult journey. Um, few of the smaller trucks actually skidded off the side, and they had to reload the heavier ones with their gold. Then in the early morning, light appeared. The convoy suddenly came to a halt, and the lead policeman jumped out. This is what the road was very much like. It was snow-covered, slippery. He hollered, quick, get out under your trucks now. Suddenly, a low-flying enemy ME-109 plane from the direction of Oslo flew over them. It had been machine-gunning cars behind them, indiscriminatory. He had seen the fire and the explosions behind him and knew that they were next. The hideous roaring of the plane came closer, leaving a trail of death, destruction, panic behind him. The lorry and truck drivers heard the plane circle and then come right at him with a roar and a hail of bullets that attacked, and then it was gone. Now, if you've ever heard war planes come down, it's like, mm, it's just deafening sound um, in this hail of bullets. I grew up in Oshkosh, where they have the EAA, and when they do those stunts and all the stuff with those things, you still hear that roar. It's just they're not shooting anybody. So they could hear these screams and shouts for help behind them. Um, 
And so they obeyed. This is what the ME-109 looked like. It was a death machine, literally. And so all these guys pulled over to the side. They waited a little longer, and then the police escort began moving up and down the line, checking for casualties, damaged vehicles. One post office van was a complete disaster. Both drivers were dead. By the time the gold had been transferred out, the convoy was underway again. Some of the lorries and trucks were dangerously overloaded with the gold, um, was moved. They moved along slowly with the drivers freezing and dead tired. Their windows had been shot out. The cold, harsh winds blew through. Um, finally, they limped in the little hammock just after um, sunrise. They were met by the chief constable and the local bank manager, but there was no time to waste. Now these are actual pictures from Norway during that time. These look like old Chevys or something, I don't know. But you can see they're all messed up along the side of the road. They face the backbreaking task of transferring the bullion from the vehicles to the Little Hammer Bank vault. And after about an hour of work, the job was finally done. The gold was safe before the townspeople even awoken. The policemen drove back to Oslo to report the safe arrival of the gold to Finance Minister Tork on his way back to town before the Germans had gotten organized. Shortly after the gold arrived in Lillehammer, some of uh, Quisling's men, now you all know who Quisling is, don't you? He was, he was in the National Sandling Party and he was a conspirator with the Nazis um, who wanted to be the Prime Minister of Norway. So he collaborated with them and he had guys that were supposed to take over um, different radio stations and printing things and all kinds of stuff like that uh, to try to help conquer Norway. And he had promised Nor uh, the Germans that he could get Norway to surrender without a fight. <laughs> Didn't happen. Anyway, Quisling's guys came and arrested the constable, taking him in for questioning. The mayor and the bank manager saw the arrest and knew that they didn't have long and that they'd be pr probably be next. Now, here's the map again showing the same route um, where they went up. And by this is a kind of a timeline. By April 9th, the Germans had landed, but they were delayed. You know why they were delayed? Their lead ship, the um, butcher, or butcher, something like that, uh, was hit by a torpedo from um, a fortress uh, right outside in the, in the fjord. And that fortress hadn't fired a torpedo in about 50 years, but when they saw these enemy ships coming up, they figured, yeah, we gotta do something. And so they did, and it was a direct hit, and they nailed this thing, and so it blocked the only navigable side of the fjord, um, stopping the Germans from getting up far enough toward Oslo. Which is a good thing. Here's a picture of Lillehammer's bank. But that's a summer picture instead of a snow-covered one. This is what it really looked like. Now, I just want to set the record straight. Somebody mentioned this before, this morning, about a book that they had read as a kid. Any of you ever read this book called Snow Treasure? Yeah. It was supposedly the story of, you know, how the Norwegians got the gold out of Norway. In the early 1940s, uh, there was this some mysterious gold ship in the Baltimore that served as the impetus to this book by Marie McSweegan. For many decades, most people believed this fictitious account of how the Norwegian authorities actually smuggled all this gold out of Norway under the watchful eye of the Nazi, using kids on sleds to carry it downhill to a waiting freighter for shipment to England. Now, I'll tell you this. It makes for a good story. Kids love it. 
Okay? And they think, oh, we could do that. In practicality and reality, do you know how much gold weighs? More than about eight kids. And you think you could stick eight kids on a sled and run them down a hill over and over and over and over thousands of times to evacuate all that gold under the eyes of the German guards? Well, McSwingen, who had been a Pittsburgh journalist and later director of public relations for the University of Pittsburgh, wrote the book. This story is based on actual happenings. For on June 28, 1940, the Norwegian freighter Puma did reach Baltimore with a cargo of gold worth about $9 million. So, she claimed the gold had actually been smuggled past dozens of unsuspecting Nazi sentries aboard all these steel sleds ridden down the hill. The Germans were actively searching everywhere for the missing gold. See, they knew that it had been in Oslo. Now it's gone, along with the king. It had been taken downhill by thousands of kids on thousands of trips for weeks. It would have been absolutely impossible. But made for a good story. There they go. <laughs> McSwigan also explained in a book that only two ch changes had been made in her brief and scan account given to the news dispatches that accompany the arrival of the ship. The Boma, a coastal motorboat, became the Clang Pierce, a fishing smack, and the distance the gold was sledded presumably was not 12 miles, but actually 35. What an impossibility. Otherwise, how could the Norse kids have set about eluding the, Ger eluding the German forces of occupation for all that time? The truth is, there were no kids and no sleds were ever involved in the evacuation of the gold. While the Buma steamer did arrive in Baltimore in June 40, very little of the rest of the story of Snow Treasure was factual or true. It is true that in 42, when the book was written, very few actual facts about the gold evaluation were known. So everything was pretty much speculation. It wasn't until the late, actually the late 1970s, that any truly factual information about how the gold got evacuated was really released. Therefore, it is no wonder that the actual facts about this leave much to fantasy and imagination. So on with the real gold story. The crates of gold bullion stayed in the North Bank for a few days until the 13th, and then because the Germans were advancing looking for this stuff, they loaded onto a commandeered Swedish goods train and traveled west toward the port of Andalusis, away from the German advance. Meanwhile, the German government and King Hakan, who was hiding up in the same area, were also separately trying to evade the German advance. The Germans had dropped paratroopers north of Oslo on April 9th after it was discovered that both the king and the gold were gone. And they set out toward El Elverum to capture the dignitaries. Now, I didn't throw any of these pictures in here, um, but if you ever go out in line and you look at the city of Alverum or Nordstrom or any of the other ones that were up there near where the king was hiding, they leveled them. I mean, it, the only thing standing were a few chimneys. That was it. And they bombed the woods and they bombed everything that could possibly have held them. Because what were they ultimately trying to do? Kill the king. If you kill the king, you stop the rebellion and the revolt. And that's what they were trying to do. So anyway, um, they, they put, uh, they come and do this good strain, travel west. Meanwhile, the German government and the king were also separately trying to evade it. And so they got on um, a train also and were evacuated. Um, anyhow, while they were doing that, the German troops, um, consisting of Austrian paratroopers, 
got in the convoy of confiscated Norwegian civilian cars and other vehicles and started out after them. But they were stopped by an improvised roadblock of fallen trees. Now, this story is actually called the Battle of uh, Midscope. This actually is very interesting because um, both the gold and the king got past it before they built this roadblock. This is kind of how it was. They had the, the road coming from Oslo going this way. Here's where they built the roadblock, right there. The Norwegians had taken up positions at all of these places up here where they could uh, set up machine guns and so forth. Then you had all of these people coming from Oslo that were trying to escape and got stopped by the roadblock. And then you had the vehicles with the Germans in. So it was a mess. Before the German convoy got there, a dozen of these Norwegian civilians who were trying to flee got there first. It gave the defending Norwegian forces a huge advantage, and even though it was dark, the Germans were forced to advance and fire force that was prepared for them. Plus, the dark German paratrooper uh, uniforms were quite a deterrent to them as they were easy to see against the snow. So here they are in their position with the, uh, the Norwegians up on the hill, the Germans down below. The opposing forces clashed about 1.30 on, on that evening, shortly after midnight, and the Norwegian defenders mustered a slightly superior force of about 130 men, okay, uh, which included a royal company of royal guards and a number of uh, hastily recruited volunteers from local rifle companies. Uh, the fight continued to about 3 a.m. with casualties on both sides being very light. But the one thing that made the big difference was the Germans lost their commander to a, sniper, a Norwegian sniper in the fighting, and the Norwegians got reinforced and regrouped. So the Germans lost their lead guy <clears throat> because of a sniper. Two men killed. Um, one of them was this military attaché, Hauptmann Spiller, and the Norwegian losses were only three guys slightly wounded. No fatalities. There's what the countryside looked like. So, let me do that. So there's the king, and he's uh, a little bit to the northeast of where all this is happening. Now, what's really important is that this battle, while it was small and only lasted a short time, allowed both the gold and little hammer and the king and the cabinet um, in Elbrook to escape, and it probably saved Norway for the Allied cause. It also proved to be a major boost to Norwegian morale, as it had been extremely low due to the initial early German success as they invaded the country. So, here they go. The Germans come up the valley, right there. The king takes off and goes this way, following the gold that was led first. Norwegian army troops, uh, including Colonel Ole Brock. Now, one of the interesting things and where I got a lot of this information was from a, a book that later he and his daughter wrote because they were part of the English SOE that, along with the king, escaped. And so he wrote this book about what actually happened. But that was never released till the 70s. OK, so nobody really knew. It. But anyway, um, 11 others were quickly deployed to Lillehammer to guard the train. And only a few soldiers initially knew what they were really guarding. Civilians were typically told the crates just contain ammunition because that's what the train was for, for carrying it. While the crates were really marked NV. What did that stand for? Where'd you think? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But you're close. One 
one of the young infantrymen guarding the train was a poet, Nordahl Grieg. You ever heard that name before? Yes. Yeah, he's the cousin of the famous musician Edward. He had been in Oslo when the Germans invaded and reported immediately for military duty. Now, when Dave was talking about his Civil War thing, there were guys that were farmers or, or had other jobs that at the drop of a hat, when they found their country was being invaded, they went to join up. And he was one of them, along with many, many others. Okay? <laughs> Reporting immediately for military duty, he soon found himself on the way to Lillehammer as part of the gold guarding detail. Later in Chomso, he wrote his famous poem. What's that? 17th of May, 1940. On board the Alpha and read it for the first time to Hans Rep on May 16th. But on May 17th, it first got broadcast on Tromso Radio. Here's a picture of the young recruits. In the last stanza, he wrote, we are so few here in this country, each fallen one's a brother or a friend. Perhaps when he wrote this, he was thinking of his comradeship that he had found in the weeks he spent with his fellow heroes who saved the Norwegian national treasury. Today, this is one of the most celebrated patriotic poems in Norway and is often read on Setna Mai as a reminder. While this was his first patriotic contribution to the Norwegian war effort, he later would make radio broadcasts in Norway. His patriotic poems would inspire a whole generation but unfortunately, he would die in the war as a war correspondent on a British bomber on a flight over Berlin. When Colonel Ole Brock arrived, he emphatically stated, we need to act fast to get this gold. The Germans had been at the Bank of Norway, found it empty, and now they're out looking for it. They arrested all the constables for questioning. I'm sorry to say, Little Hammond's constable was taken for questioning yesterday, so the gold can't stay here much longer. Now everybody knew what the co cargo was and what was really at stake. They discussed how they could move the gold, but decided that using those 26 lorries again would make it too big a target for the German aerial spotter planes. So they drove on in a covered road. By April 13th, though, the Germans had moved up the Gubenstall Valley on a trail of the king and the Norwegian gold bullion, and both were being backward toward Andalusness on the west coast. That was their goal. Here come all the Germans. Not only that, up here, which is in Trondheim, they were uh, coming down this path too. So these guys, you know, when I when I first started researching this, and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking. They were like sometimes hours, sometimes you know almost minutes of separation for them to get away, and it almost seemed like an act of God that that they they had the right place, the right people at the right time that helped them to move this. Now, it was interesting because the king went north up here toward Molda, and somewhere along the line, he over, you know, he passed the gold shipment, but they both went the same way. Captain Olson said, no, I think the only way to move it now is on that goods train, hauling wood and ammunition. It would look perfectly normal, and they could be hidden on an outway signing for a few days, nobody, you know, know the difference until the British could help. The train left Lillehammer on April 13th with its weight and need for total secrecy created unique transportation problems. After several instances of near disasters with German troops near Donbass, the Norwegians guarding the gold managed to escape with their cargo. So here's piling wood into a now, I'll tell you something. What's even harder to do is get visual images of the very acts that they were doing back at that time, but I found them. <laughs> they had seen the shiny glint of the German helmets near the station as they pulled into the train. 
Dumbass was where they needed to switch the train to another track heading north toward Herkin. Their Swedish train engineer got off the train to get drunk. Actually, just to get a drink of alcohol, but he did get drunk. He almost got him killed because the Germans that were there, he went into the station, started talking to him, and spilled the beans and told them about gold. The only good thing was he was drunk. So they didn't know if he was really telling the truth. You know how people exaggerate when they get drunk? Plus, they were looking for the king and the gold. After hearing about the gold, Lieutenant Richter, who was in the station, telephoned German high command to report a questionable incident before he and his men went to check it out. There's the station. They don't have the snow, but so what? Responding quickly, the Norwegians had been forced to kill the 10 Germans at Dabas, including Lieutenant Richter, who had been sent by remember this name, Major Horst, to check on the possibility of the train carrying either the king or the Norwegian gold bullion. So now they've got two targets, and they don't know which is where, and so it's a mad dash. After killing all these Germans, the Norwegian buried them in snowdrifts, took their German uniforms, thinking they might dress as Germans. Now, remember this. The foresight of these guards was incredible. Every single one of them spoke German as well as Norwegian. And they figured if we've encountered them here at the station, there's a good chance we'll encounter them again. What better way not to be detected than to be dressed like them? So they killed the guys at the station. And since all the Norwegian guards spoke fluent German, they dressed them in line. Finally, they got the train switched and headed up. Now, this is kind of what the train looked like with their load of, you know, cars and wood and whatever else they claimed was in there. As it turned out, it was a good thing they were wearing those uniforms because 30 miles northwest of Damas, they had just gotten up ahead of steam when Sergeant Borg the substitute Norwegian engineer for the Swede who was drunk and was sleeping it off, hit the air brakes. What's the matter, the captain said. Uh, trees and logs on the tracks, sir. Well, at first glance, the fallen trees across the tracks looked like a natural blockage. Since it had snowed heavily that night, but as the train came to a stop, they could see that it wasn't. Stay where you are, I'll go check it out. Now, does that look natural? Yeah, but it's not. Those trees were chopped so that they fall over the, the top, and then behind them said, whoever put up the barrier probably hoped that the train would come a little closer, but now they're going to have to walk through the snow to come to us. Soon in formation, about 12 German Gestapo, all dressed in their black uniforms with white snow helmets, armed with machine guns, appeared from behind the barrier. They marched toward the train as Johan Olsen, the captain there, wondered why the blockage and double check. Must be another example of German thoroughness, he thought. As Johan stepped down from the train dressed in his German lieutenant uniform to meet him. Lieutenant Richter, they asked? Uh, yeah, by the day. I'll be late if you delay me, he said, assuming Richter's role. The officer glared at him. So here are all the Gestapo guys. We both got jobs to do, he said. If you cooperate, you'll be on your way soon. I've been sent by headquarters to search this train. What for? It's already been searched for a king in Norway and for the gold. What are you looking for? Well, I'm aware that these searches have been made, Lieutenant. While the army might be satisfied, the Gestapo is not. In a lot of stories through World War II, the, the Gestapo did all kinds of weird things and extra searches that 
uh, were kind of hard to understand, but they were very thorough. And it says, well, I tend to believe you. The ammunition could just be on top, hiding the gold. We need to search it thoroughly. The vaults in Oslo are empty, so the gold's got to be something. And this train is the only lead we currently have. Um, so they get their heads together. Then we must careful uh, made inquiries about the train, both in Norway and in Sweden. It left Sweden carrying spare car parts from a factory, and we know that it unloaded its cargo in Little Hammer on April 12th. While there, it was reloaded with supposedly ammunition on instructions from the German occupying forces. However, guess who hadn't arrived in Little Hammer yet? The Germans. He said our troops had not gotten to Little Hammer by the 12th. Therefore, this train was loaded by Norwegian civilians, not German authorities. Therefore, we're not sure of its cargo. Do you see why it's necessary to search? Oh, yeah, sir, Johan said. So they went about it. Now, where are your men? The German asked him. Probably that's how he asked him. <laughs> In different trucks, sir, as I told them not to show themselves, as we had no idea who blocked this line. Well, that's understandable. Anyway, it's not them that I want to question. It's your Swedish driver, who obviously watched this train be loaded in Lillehammer. He told you last night that there was gold on board, uh, although you chose to ignore because he was drunk. After a few minutes of interrogating and slapping Larson, who was faking to be the driver. He had taken, you know, Jonas's place because he was still drunk. Um, anyhow, Olsen jumped up to assist by opening the first box and told his men hiding under the tarp um, to pair up, and when the Germans came, to stab So he shouted, hey, first time lucky, here it is, we found it. And so, pretending they found the gold. Now, you gotta remember, all the while, these Germans have machine guns pointed at them. Uh, would have been a scare. He slid out of the way and allowed the first German officer to climb up and jump into the truck, into the waiting arms of Erickson and Schwartz. Ring and Kreffling were ready for the second guy. Johan and Borg watched with horrified fascination as the four Gestapo officers in succession climbed in and met their doom. The hammering continued, but when no talking could be heard, one of the other Gestapo officers or soldiers became very suspicious, jumped up to the next car to see what was going on, and when he saw blood, he raised his gun to fire at the guys. But Erickson, who was prepared, cut him down with two quick bursts point-blank rage. They had, at the station, gathered all of the guns that the Germans had, and this is what they were using, which is an MG-42 machine gun, one of the deadliest things from all World War II. Only two of the Germans escaped into the woods. Now, that could have been bad, However, suddenly there was a burst of several rifle shots from the top of the slope, and a voice called out in Norwegian, Captain Olsen, are your men all right? We got both of them. Johan curiously peered out of the truck. Who are you? We're the Hinfi Reserves and Rifle Club, sir. Think about this. All the way down the line, this was better than a grapevine. They had told all the little towns and all of the, you know, mayors and all of the town council guys who was coming, not exactly what was coming, but who was coming, and to be ready for them, and they were. Well, come on down and let us thank you. So they watched a dozen men with rifles stand up. Three guys came down on skis with rifles on their back, and he said, we watched the whole thing, sir. We noticed Colonel Brock 
uh, that they were notified to watch for you, and we thought you might talk your way out of it, but then the shooting started, and the two Gestapo guys who tried hiding under the trees were easy targets for it. Well done. They gathered up all the machine guns from the dead guys, obtained the uniforms, rolled them into the forest, and buried them in the snowbank. That's what they were facing. After checking all the brake horses for leaks, they were finally ready to roll again, and they got the train moving, and then shortly rolled in the Hitby station. They needed to make a, a dive for cover soon, at least before reconnaissance planes came to check where they were at, because after a few minutes, and they shuttled into a branch line and were ready to continue. <coughs> well done, Borg. This place is everything I hoped it would be. It looks as if we have given them the slip, and we'll finally be able to get some sleep as soon as we eat something. We'll only need two guys on duty to watch for spotter planes, and they are to report to me if for anything they see. The station master's coming down, said Borg. His name's um, Valdo, and I'm sure he can arrange for it. So there's a guy guarding the hoses. When, when Howell uh, reached the train, Sergeant Borg went out to meet him. Borg, what a pleasant surprise. Please tell His Majesty that I've arranged housing for him and his staff here in town. So they didn't even know what was going on. They knew it was something important. And they probably figured that it was one or the other. We're not carrying the king, Borg said. What are we getting that idea? Well, if it's not the king, then you must have the gold. Borg, who stood a giant size six foot six, looked down at him sharply. Bow, bow. What makes you think there's gold on that train? All the stations down the line know that the king is traveling on one train and the country's gold is on the other one. So if you don't have his majesty, you've got the gold. Mm. Well, that's correct, Captain Olson informed him. And the enemy, I'm sorry to say, knows it too, due to some loose lips along the way. We need to rest and hide here for a few days. Certainly, sir. Shall I send a crack rifle team down here to help guard? No, I better not. The enemy has planes and are searching for us, and extra guards might just attract attention. I'm hoping that hiding here, we've thrown them off the scent, thanks to your offer. Very well, sir. Anything else we could do? Well, we could use some water. Fresh food would be nice. So they did. This is what the spotter planes looked like. Um, they were like Cessna Cubs. You know, there wasn't much to them, but they could glide forever, like, you know, eagles on the wind or hawks or whatever. They just soared. Suddenly, one of the guards cried, German spotter plane overhead, sir. Very, very high. Then it started circling, and then, after a few minutes, it finally flew off direct toward the east. A few minutes later, the plane came back, this time diving and circling lower. Suddenly, it dove down, leveled off, and flew at a tree level straight above the hidden siding. The men saw it bank, but it was too late. They tried to gain altitude to clear the height of the steep quarry walls. Suddenly, a loud explosion, followed by flames, and thick, billowing black smoke marked the spot where the plane had crashed into the rock, rock wall. What an incredible but fortunate event. There it was. Harold and Emil Bergstrom, who were with the station master, heard the plane roaring down towards them. They turned quickly, dropping to the ground as they raised their heads to see what happened. Harold's eyes were attracted to something that was glimmering and shining brightly. And then they spotted something red that they could see against the snowy white landscape. They noticed somebody up there was in the middle of the road wearing this bright red hat. The loud crash of the plane occupied their whole attention. And it was only in the silence which followed that they could hear the faint sound of the running car engine. They looked closer and Harold could see a car parked on the side of the road. It was the same car they had seen twice before in town. After the crash, the man on the road dashed for his car, the red cap on his head. Harold immediately realized he must stop him at all costs. So what was he doing? 
He was signaling the plane with something. What do you suppose it was? Your red hat. <laughs> well, the red hat indicated who he was, but it was a mirror. You ever do that? Mm -hmm. You ever use a mirror? You can see that if I had a mirror and I got the sun coming, I could blind you with it, almost flashing it back at you. And that's what he was doing. It was clear to him now how the Gestapo and the plane knew where the train was so easily. The mysterious man was the enemy spy who had signaled him. Took a cave for aim with his rifle and shot out one of the back tires of the car. Now, I don't know how far that was. It was probably 150 yards at least. Well, that's a pretty good shot to nail a tire at that. Anyway. Oh, no, you don't, he said. We need to talk to you. So the man paused, cast a glance in the direction of the train, thinking that was where the shot came from. Then he ran off and fell and died. Once safely in, he crawled into thick cover. But there he came face to face with Harold and Emil, who were also dope for cover, cover to hide when they heard the spotter plane crash. Harold whispered to Emil, not to shoot him, because we need to question him. The two boys circled behind, and Harold finally jumped on the spy, but suddenly discovered he was a lot stronger than they thought he was. Now, this is what these old cars looked like. <coughs> and he nailed one of those back tires, which probably could be done. As Harold was on his back, getting the worst of the struggle, Emil swung his rifle butt and, stuck and struck the spy in the head with a hefty blow. Knocked out cold, they dragged him to the edge of the woods where Captain Olson met him. This is the same guy we saw in this Gestapo block and later saw him in town near the station. Well, why didn't you report that to me, he said. We did, sir, but you thought he was one of the members of the rifle club. And we didn't know what he was up to, but he obviously was wearing his red cap, sir, and saving the plane with something bright. That's his car over there, still running, but with a flat tire. He must have hit the spy too hard, because within minutes, he stopped breathing and died. Now, these are the kind of hats. And the funny thing is, not only was the spy wearing them, but the resistance wore these as a signal of resistance. So he was using this kind of to, in a false sense, of who he really was, because he was the spy. Anyway, too bad, boys. Would have been nice to question him and know what he knows, but go through the box, find out what he's at. So they dug through it. And they found out his name was uh, Frederick Kraft. He was a spy from Dover. And says, I'm afraid he must not have uh, been all that convincing to horse on the telephone after all. So he put this treacherous spy onto us. Harold put his hand in the man's pocket and pulled out a magnifying hand mirror. Probably this, don't you think? Yep, that'd be it. Using his red cap, used to signal solidarity. The only thing that could be visible for miles on a free snow a covered white landscape. No wonder they knew where we were. So that's what he was doing. No use staying here any longer now that the Germans know where we are thanks to this spy. Well, anyway, as they're digging down through, in the lower part, it says Captain Olsen returned to the spy and rolled him over. Just a minute, there's a telephone number here in the back of his cigarette pack. Dover 295. That wouldn't be his own number, would it? Hardly. Said that's probably his contact. This is what the cigarette packs look like. Mm -hmm. Captain Olson made a phone call to the Norwegian Exchange operator in Dover, which he knew happened to be a loyal Norwegian as he talked to him earlier in the morning to get the message through Colonel Hagen about a paratrooper drop near Damas. As he talked to the operator, the operator informed him that the man named Kraft had called Major Horst of German High Command about an hour before, and he had listened in. His call could have been easily about the King's location because he said the vehicle in question at Troll, uh, Troll Line, that's all. Was his 
was the German replying? What was the German replying? He asked, not much. They just thanked him and hung up. So then Olsen decided, hey, I could probably impersonate Kraft. So he asked the Dover oper operator, he said, Kraft is the guy I need to impersonate. What did he sound like? Now, if you've ever been over in Norway, you know that every area's got its own accent. I, I won't say dialect, but it almost is. But its own accent and how they, they emphasize words. In the, and uh, the Auckland area, which is in the center area around uh, Rukan and the, the um, uh, heavy water operation, they have a very distinctive accent, and he said he had a broad Auckland uh, accent, much like mine. This accent came through even in German, so please remember that when you're speaking to him. So Olsen dialed this and said, this is Frederick Kraft speaking. Just a minute, please. So they went to fetch Major Horse, and then when he came back on, he said, did you get my message? And, sir, I've been informed of your precise location. Um, I thought you'd be sending further information. Well, I received all the de details in your first report, so you can speak freely, as Dover is now in the hands of the German army and everything is poised for the Battle of Damas tomorrow. So he told them extra things that they needed to know to continue. So that's why I said there are a lot of these little things that you just, you know, it doesn't just happen by coincidence. Horse sounded excited. There were clearly no room in his mind for doubt um, as to the authority of this caller. Are you telling me that my reconnaissance plane isn't back for a second look? No, sir, it hasn't. That's why I phoned you. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. I know everything I need to know. So, here's what happens. Now you've got the Germans who have moved up both sides of the Gubernstalen Valley up toward Dover. They're heading toward Namas. The king's up here. The gold's out. I mean, the king's up here. The gold's behind it, shortly behind it, heading to this little um, town called Hittipi. Very good, Kraft. Thank you. And make sure that there's gold on that train. Well, there has to be, he said. Um, I heard the Gestapo officer say so. Well, keep them under observation till I get there. And then tomorrow, when the bullion's in our position, you can bring it back to Dover. And then he hung up. So, Johan said, shift the bullion into lorries. We'll drive off and be well away before dawn. So they arranged for all that to happen. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to kind of shorten this up, but I'll show you all the different things. 20 minutes later, though, Captain Olson walked to the station to telephone uh, Colonel Hagen in Andalusness to come down there. And he said, what's the report? He said, it's already snowing heavily. The sky is black and lowering over the mountains where you are and should reach you in a couple of hours. You ever been in snow like that? Yeah, it's bad. You can hardly see. Um, so anyway, what happened was, um, Colonel Hagen said, you can't come down. They dropped parachuters all over in Dulles, And they're dressing as Norwegian um, army. They've killed a lot of our guys and they're dressing like the Norwegian army. So you can't come down here. Um, so he says, we'll have to move from here tonight because they're coming through. Um, and so Olson thanked him and said, fine, we won't come down to the Dulles tonight. We'll keep our stuff together and we'll come whenever you think it's safe and clear of the paratroopers. So they sat with the train. They managed to avoid further confrontations. And finally on the 17th, they got the bullion to the West Norwegian city of Trollheim, which wasn't far from the coast. Now, the British had been informed 
of the jewel and they were, and agreed to pick it up. So as they moved, um, they had dropped, the, you see on this map, the paratroopers have been dropped all around here. Well, the Brits have been dropped here too. And so as they came in, they were actually going to put a block right there. And so anyway, um, they were worried about spotter planes and all this kind of stuff. And so they said, we can't, um, you know, use the train again. We can't use uh, lorries. We're going to have to hide for a while. And so Valdal, the guy from the town, said, why don't you plan on a short um, journey? There's a large unoccupied logging camp, not more than three miles from here, deep in the forest. Make a perfect hide out for you. And we've got quarry trucks there to move the stuff. So they got all these quarry trucks. And in about half an hour, they filled them up with all the gold. And they set off for this quarry. That's kind of what it must have been like driving it. Meanwhile, back at Dover, Major Horse had a plan that he wanted to get to. Now, he knew where that train was because of the spotter plane. And so, with this storm coming in, he wanted to go, but he didn't think he could go. He didn't think he could travel. And so, anyway, he had received the confirmed message from Kraft about the gold train. He was confident he was going to find success, but it really wasn't Kraft. It was who? That Colonel Olson. So anyway, he arranged to do a paratroop drop over Trollheim, but as the storm came in, he realized that the heavy snow was approaching the heights of Dover, and all planes and flights would be grounded, and he knew he couldn't get there. So, what do you do? It's supposed to last most of the night, his you know, sergeant told the whole problem. Told him, he said, but if you're determined to get down there, why not go down by motor car? How many of you have ever driven in the mountains in Norway? You ever do that? I'm going to show you a picture. Snow covered and slippery. With snow coming down. Okay? So it's a single lane road. They had 20 some miles that they had to go. It was actually about a 65 mile trip winding back and forth, but it was really only about 25 as the crow flies. But that's what they had to go through. Grueling, mountainous, 65 mile trip. They finally reached it in the early morning, and Horse thought, we got you now. So he gets all of his men ready. They're going to attack the train. As he approached the, the train that was directly in front of him, he leaped up into the cars, followed by some of his men who jumped on the sides, and there was nothing. It was totally empty. He got a sinking feeling in his gut, knowing they'd been duped again. Search the whole train, he said, don't separate. All of you search from here to the engine. If you don't find anything, try the other end. In a few minutes, he knew the worst. The entire train was completely empty. He soon found some, someone in town who knew where the gold and trucks would be if he'd get them. So what did he have his guys do? Go and drag people out of bed. 4 a.m. in the morning. Pointing their machine guns at them. So when they drove into town and stopped, he got his men to force into the nearest homes and bring the inhabitants out of the street. They lined them up standing up, particularly clothed, partially clothed, and freezing in the middle of the night. He reckoned that they would tell them what they wanted to know pretty quick or freeze to death. About 50 people from all ages had been assembled and or spoke to him in their native language, since he knew Norwegian also. He ordered them to stand in lines where the soldiers stood in the front with their machine guns pointed out. Today, a train came to Trollheim. 
It was carrying the Norwegian gold reserves. Tell me where it is, and you may return to your homes. The Norwegians remained quiet, and now the Major's voice became harsher. Look, we came to Norway to protect you people from our mutual enemies, but you Norwegians are not grateful and you're not cooperating, which forces me to be harsh on you. And that was a big lie they always said. We're here to help you, when in reality, they weren't. So anyway, I just made this sketch up, because there was no way to get 65 people out of the middle of the street with machine guns. <laughs> And they didn't have any showing it. <laughs> he raised his voice to a bellow and said, If you have not given me the information I seek by the time I count to 53, of you'll be shot. The Norwegians knew he meant this, for the people all over the country had already been shot for failing to supply the Germans with information. Finally, Haldal, standing in the front line with his wife and two daughters, Step forward, and he said, um, I, the king wasn't here. And he said, the train that the station master was supposed to look after was carrying the royal party, not the gold. Well, if he could convince the Germans to be on the lookout for private cars, it would be very likely they could escape from that logging camp with the lorries and they would find, um, you know, be able to telephone Captain Olsen at the camp that they had just installed a new phone out there and warn him about a horse in disguise. So this was kind of a mind game back and forth. It's hard to think when you got one of those pointing at you. The gold wasn't brought to Trondheim, sir. The gold that the station was carrying, the king and the royal party. Horse stopped counting and glared at him. The royal party in a good strain. What kind of fool do you take me for? You'll be taught the German army can't be taken in the fairy tale stories. Schultz? Then Schultz steps forward. He says, you know, sir, sir, there could be something to this. But the man said, it was to capture the king that you originally sent, originally sent Lieutenant Winter to Donbass in the first place. And that information was not fed to us deliberately to deceive us. It was given to us by a Norwegian. We met, or we learned, that His Majesty was going to Donbass by listening in on a telephone call from the driver of that very train. So he may be telling the truth. Coincidence, isn't it? So, then roared a horse, seizing all of his dressing gown. So tell me, where the devil is the king then? What's he doing on the good train? What was the only safe transportation he could get hold of? Hmm. Then show me where he's, what house he's at, where he's sleeping. Well, he didn't stay here. They borrowed three vehicles and drove away not too long ago. How long ago? About an hour. They waited. The moon had finally come out, and so now they wouldn't have to use their headlights. They could actually see. Well, which way did he go? So Valo points to the forest road, knowing there would certainly be tracks along there that they could follow, and that the, that the snow would have the tracks of the lorries. So Horse sent two of his soldiers to confirm their tracks, and that they led someplace. And so then he says this, such tracks would be easy to follow, and I don't think they can get very far in this heavy snow. He says, what's your name, man? So he tells me, well, I'm Major Heinrich Horst, and I'll see to it that you're generally rewarded for your cooperation. Thank you. And you, you look at that, and you think, after he threatens to kill him, they're going to reward him? How weird. When the Germans had driven off, everybody crowded around uh, Valdol and talked all at once. Some congratulated him, thinking that was a brilliant plan. I didn't have to warn Colonel Olson, or Captain Olson, by telephone that they're heading this way. That camp just got the new telephone uh, system, and he knows my voice. So he tried to call them, but unfortunately, guess what? The line was dead. So, his only 
alternative was to go down there himself. And he realized it was very risky. The logging camp couldn't be contacted by phone. He'd have to ski there. So he dressed in warm clothes, strapped on his skis, and started off out through the pine forest toward the logging camp. Good thing he knew how to ski. <laughs> Meanwhile, the horse and his men found the going along the forest track incredibly difficult. And as they're driving down there, they can't make, you know, any idea of where they're really going. After about three miles, Sergeant Schultz glimpsed through the trees at a log cabin. He knew a horse had to be worn out. They had slept all night. And worse, little resistance, the idea of taking shelter for a few hours wasn't a bad idea. Horse's first reply was exactly what Schultz expected. If the king can drive through this, so can we. Stubborn Germans. <laughs> so this is kind of like the road that they probably were going along. Would have been terrible trying to follow this. But even worse, hmm. what if they did find the tracks? So as they're going, they're looking for these tracks of those lorries. Horses exhausted, all of the men went to this little house that they saw. And in the house, they fought, found a stack of logs by a fireplace, soon got a roaring fire going. Others closed the shutters while others lit paraffin uh, lamps. They set up a cooking stove and soon were eating tins of food for them to eat. Meanwhile, back at the logging camp, a short ways away, Carl Rung, who was on duty at the camp, listened to the noise being made by the Trollheim men. This Sergeant Bork, who was the great big guy at the 6'6", six, six, you know, fella couldn't sleep. And he told the men to quiet down. At half past one, the snow stopped and everyone outside looked around. For some time, the noise coming from the cabin inside was only slight, but that increased to a low buzz with occasional hoots of laughter. The men started getting louder. Finally, Wing went over and woke up Colonel Olson. He left up furious at the way they were carrying on. The disturbance had been caused by the arrival of Valdau with the urgent news that German troops had arrived from Cholheim and were now in the forest looking for the train's cargo. Borg stood outside listening to Captain Ogden, Ol Olson talk to the men deciding not to go in, not just yet. Lieutenant Ring wondered where his uncle wanted, or was, and when the sergeant had returned to the cabin, um, he went out back to look for him. Two found a place to watch the old sergeant from and sat down in the snow to keep an eye on him. Suddenly, these two, Astrup and Crefley, were not the only ones to observe Sergeant Borg's vigil. Only a half mile away, German Sergeant Schultz, horse sergeant, mm -hmm. who had not, you know, had not stayed inside the cabin long enough to eat the meal, soon got his hands and feet warm enough, and he had a couple of pulls of a brandy flask, told Major Horse he was going out to follow the tracks of the Royal Cars in the snow. He felt certain that the Royal Party couldn't have gotten very far away. As soon as he opened the door, he heard the noise of men's voices echoing through the forest woods. He listened and he called the major at once. Together they stood in the doorway and Horse lifted his field glasses. The first thing he saw was a tall, slim, elderly man with a military mustache wearing a military gray coat standing alone in front of another, another cabin a short distance away. Schultz! That station master was telling the truth. I see the Norwegian king. Let me have a look. So, he's all alone. His men must obviously be drunk. Let's go and nab them. Sure looks like them. Well, it's worth a try, Horst said. So, he and four of his men on skis, he said, we'll have to walk back but we'll go now. If he gives us any trouble, we'll have to knock him on the head and carry him back. But there's plenty of cover. Just make sure they understand that they're not going to hit him hard. 
We want them alive. Now this is kind of a change because initially they tried to kill them. Now they want them alive. After regretfully beginning to feel the cold in the hiding spot, suddenly overcome with astonishment <laughs> that four Germans on skis had suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Only a few yards from him grabbed Sergeant Bork. The Germans weren't speaking threatening to him. In fact, they sounded unexpectedly polite. Then, just as Kerfman was about to depart, the Germans said, Your Majesty. They asked him if he was prepared to go with them quietly. So, now you get the plot. They're thinking they got the king. And Borg, he doesn't have a clue what's going on. But he realized who they think he is. Sure looks like the king. He hoped it wouldn't be long before he was missed. But anyway, he had left little signals. He actually drew swastikas in the snow with his boot as they were walking away. He shrugged his shoulders and he said, Hey, I'm an old man, gentlemen, and I'm accustomed to walking very far. However, I shall be compliant and we shall proceed. So he left all these little clues behind and soon the other guys came out, Crafton and The other Norwegian guy decided that, that they better go get some help. They said, poor old boy, to a stranger he certainly might resemble the king, but they better stop before they get him there because they'll discover that he's not. If they get back to their officer, he'll know that they've got the wrong guy at once, and he'll be a goner. Quite sure you're right, sir. I'm sorry, Valdo said. Major horse is nobody fool. So? Off they went. He said they drove here in cars, four cars, 24 guys in all, but we still outnumber them. There's a cabin about a mile away, but I think we can take it. So, Major Horse was the guy that, that Olson knew they were trying to dodge. And so he looked at him and he said, this plan could work, but we can't chance horse meeting face to face with Borg, or he'll kill him for sure. We'll f and he'll find out about us. We need to simultaneously attack the cabin and rescue Borg before they catch on. So they all decided they were going to grab the supplies. What are those things? <laughs> and grenades. And they would attack simultaneous both the house and get Borg back. They were wearing Gestapo officers' uniforms to distract them, and they sent two guys down, and one of the guards said, Sir, you can't go down there alone. Why not, Johan said. They wouldn't dare check me. I'm a Nazi officer. It's obvious, but I'm not looking for a fight. But you don't look right. Gestapo officers don't go wandering around in the forest at night. You need at least one other guard with you. Well, okay, put on this Gestapo helmet and overcoat, come join me. So they did. Off they went. After a brief strategy plan, the two guys darted into the night on their skis, took off to rescue Sergeant Bor. Through his binoculars, Heinrich Horst watched anxiously as his men returned at a snail's pace with his majesty. Although well out of sight of the other camp, he realized they must be leaving tracks that could be followed without difficulty, even by guys on snow on skis. The moment the king was missed, the guards would be after him. And like bees out of a hive, the fight in the open forest against first-class marksmen was the last thing horse wanted. Well, let's have a look, Schultz said. So he grabbed the binoculars, and just as Knut and Johan walked out of the forest into the moonlight, sure looks like this Stockholm. And the difference, arm, the German army never wanted to cross paths with Gestapo because they had superiority. And so even if there were only two of them against horse 12 or 
24 guys or whatever, he still didn't want to do it. Gestapo would be, by God, sir, it's lucky we didn't attack him. When Horst took the glasses and saw he felt sick with rage, I don't know where they came from, but I'm going to get the king myself. But sir, this Gestapo certainly won't part with him. Oh, yes, they will, particularly when he sees who he has to deal with and if he refuses, I'll kill him. Schultz knew there was no use trying to reason with Horst, because he was in a stubborn mood. Not only that, the week before he had been reprimanded by the German high command for letting both the king and the gold escape, so he would do anything to get it back. The four German soldiers escorted Borg, um, who were escorting him, uh, to see the German officer approach them on skis, and when he angrily demanded the return of the royal prisoner, they looked rather sheepish. Lerdal, feeling himself into the Nazi or the Gestapo part, bawled out at them to stand at attention, and Borg just looked at him with disdain. Johann walked over to him at once, saluted, and said, Your Majesty, I apologize for the indignity to which you have been subjected. If you will only, and then he stopped, and he saw a skier coming from the direction of the German's camp, and he quickly identified himself as a German officer. The men from Toldheim saw him too, and he said, Major Heinrich Horst, Good evening, Major Johann, spoke in German. It appears we have an unfortunate misunderstanding. Since your men do not appear to have injured my prisoner, His Majesty, I won't hold that against you and your men, but I would be pleased if you instructed your men to return to me immediately. Something in that tone of it and his impertinence in the voice set off a warning bell in the horse's head. He had heard the voice before, but he couldn't remember where. The king had certainly was certainly inadequately guarded, or he would not have been able to walk around alone. I've got 24 men with me, and I've come from Dover to escort them safely on the express orders of General um, von Falkenhorst, and you will therefore be good enough to relinquish him to me. My good major, you must be joking. What possible reason would I have for handing you my prisoner? And then they stood there with their silly grins. <laughs> Something suddenly clicked inside a horse's brain. Now he had it. He knew exactly where he'd heard that voice before, for no one had ever addressed him so importantly for some time. No one, that is, except the caller from the Donbass station. That young upstart must be this same guy. He was sure of it. He was also the man who must have killed Richter and possibly the Scapo men at the roadblock. He couldn't possibly be German, which meant he had to be Norwegian. With certainty, Horst drew his pistol to shoot him, but Canute, unnoticed in the background, reacted with lightning efficiency. His burst from his MG-42 machine gun instantly leveled horse, and then he turned and mowed down four other soldiers who were standing in attention. So, there's horse with a pistol. <coughs> Not much of a match against an MG-42. Suddenly, directly behind him, shooting broke out from all over. The men from the troll line must have taken Canute's gunfire as a signal to begin their assault. Hand grenades were going off, and, every, and the guns were shooting everywhere. Down, shouted Johann, as the bullets were flying wildly. Horst began speaking in German, telling Johann in frigid tones that that was no way to treat his men. Sergeant Borg, you're all right now. This is Captain Olsen in disguise. Oh, thank God, he said. So he didn't even know. Their return to the cabin was greeted with tremendous relief by the others who they had left to guard the gold. I'll make this short. Basically what happened is there were 10 of the Norwegians that got killed. All 24 of the, Nor of the Germans got leveled in that attack. So they were safe. And they got the gold eventually um, with the help of, of 
these lorries and other guys to the main road in the Nelsness um, to go down and move it out to mold. Uh, as the king went up to mold up, they drove to Nelsness. And, let's see what number I'm here. They circled back. I'll show you this one. Oops, that's not the right one. They circled back. They circled back from Trumheim. The king went up here to Hafarsus and eventually ended up by Molda. And the gold came back down this way with the British commandos blocking them since they had killed off all the paratroopers and moved up. And they moved the gold down here eventually getting to an uh, end all of us to go to the ships. Now, I've got some more stuff, but I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go quick through some of these and show you what the pictures were like. Um, as they were going, um, these heavy gold laden trucks finally made their way, and guess what was happening all the time? They were being bombed. That whole port um, was being bombed daily because that was the staging area for the British commandos. So, come in. Um, several times during the evacuation, um, they had a hold up, um, but eventually they made it. Uh, it said the heavy trucks that carried the gold. Um, or they didn't know whether they were heavy trucks or capturing the escaping king but it was like the hand of God or the local rifle club or friendly farmers along the way who helped the struggling Norwegians to find a way for them to wiggle out of every problem and eventually get everyone to safety it was described by those along the way as having an angel in their pocket who was watching out for them and what greatly helped was the confusion between the two, that they didn't know whether they were actually hunting the king or hunting the gold until eventually on April 20th, um, when they finally got down to um, Andalusis. As they were waiting to evacuate, they had another problem, howling wolves. Now, have you ever seen the pictures of the Norwegian wolves? They're big. These Arctic wolves are huge things. And one of the guys got taken by one of them. But they eventually got out of there. Finally, they reached the Dallas about midnight. The lorries um, were silhouetted among the glow of campfires with all the commandos around them. But there still were German snipers. So they finally got them to the port. There are your commanders. Near Molda, the, the Norwegian king and his son Olaf and the party who were guarded by his royal guards of expert marksmen hid out the town of Afarsus until they were taken on board the British cruiser HMS Glasgow in Molda on the 20th and conveyed a further 1,000 kilometers north to Tromsø where the provincial capital was established on May 1st. Haken and Prince, Crown Prince Olaf took a residency in a forest cabin as they were hiding out. The gold was split between three ships. The first, the British cruiser, Galatee, loaded with 200 crates, but because it was too big to turn around, and it departed from Mendelssohn's running at full speed in reverse to exit the fjord on the 25th. Luftwaffe bombers appeared and no further loading could be done due to the approach of the German troops from um, Gubernstall Valley and the heavy air raids that the Germans inflicted on. 18 tons of gold uh, in 301 large or 246 smaller crates were left on the docks Later, they came back. 
and the lorries were moved over to Molda to be um, embarked on the British cruiser Glasgow with the king and the government, and then taken north. <clears throat> but anyway, they eventually got them, and the coastal steamer um, Dreba eventually took on those 30 crates that had been left behind and moved them among other fishing uh, things to get all the gold where it's supposed to be. So finally, by the 20th, the king, the prince, and all the gold had been loaded up on the British um, ships, and by the 25th, all of it was safely evacuated to England. So here's, I forget, those are the fishing ships that they did, but I'll show you where it went. And all the while they're doing this, they're of course under attack. Here's where it went. The gold went from Molda through London, through Great Britain, went overland, and then part of it went up to Canada, and part of it went to Baltimore, Maryland. And that's why there was the Snow Treasure book written, because when they eventually came in a month later, and McSwain, or whatever her name was, from the Pittsburgh uh, paper, saw this, she made up a story. Hmm. Thanks for watching and for listening. Eventually, he got loaded on first on Glasgow, and, and then they went out, and they eventually came back in to load up some of the gold. But all of it was like the shell game. It's like, is it here?